presenter who is a long, long time friend of mine and uh, is a lifelong resident of Napoleon, Ohio. Who doesn't know where Napoleon is? You don't know where Napoleon is? Straight north from you. Just head north and keep going. To get into beautiful farmland, beautiful land. You got, you got to go a little west. Well, I don't know where he's from. <laughs> You know where he's from, though? Who? Oh. No, I don't know where he's from. West, West Carolina? Uh, West, or, uh, sorry, New Carlisle. New Carlisle. Yeah, that'd be a little straighter. Yeah. yeah. That, that'd be closer. Yeah. yeah. Okay. John's uh, education was in liberal arts. He got a degree in business administration in uh, Rollins College in Winter Park, Florida. Sounds like tough duty, John. <laughs> And uh, then he came home and joined his father in the construction business. His father was Rem Reese, and his brother was in the business. And the three of them diversified their business into, into a full range of highway work. And then we gradually got into specializing in concrete work, concrete sawing, and curing, and joint sawing, and sealing. And then John took the company and expanded it into concrete pavement bridge deck maintenance and uh, eventually went on to working nationwide. John has recently divested himself of the company and the uh, company Uh, Don touched on. I'm going to digress just a little. Uh, this morning one of the presenters uh, alluded to a uh, correcting a skid problem on a uh, slope and a curve, I believe. And there is a process called grooving, diamond grooving in particular, which is used commonly on airport uh, airfield runways in a transverse pattern of about quarter by quarter grooves for skid resistance. But its initial use uh, really was uh, longitudinal on highways just for skid resistance, and in particular on slopes and curves. So overlays are not the only answer, and this, this applies to asphalt or concrete pavements. So uh, uh, diamond grooving is, uh, is an alternative to this. Now, diamond uh, grinding, I want to uh, make sure, and again, Don alluded to this, and I'll, I'll get a little more specific uh, in that we're talking diamond grinding, not carbide milling. Originally, I think that was called uh, rotomilling, milling uh, cold planing, uh, a variety of names, but it's done with machines equipped with carbide tips 
and it's a hammering process where diamond grinding is a grinding process using water cooled diamond blades. So uh, be aware of the difference. I've had many people tell me when I say we're in the grinding business, uh, oh yes, they just did that to a stretch of highway and then they covered it up with black stuff. And I said, no, that was not grinding, that was uh, uh, carbide milling. So diamond grinding is done with diamond blades. As the picture showed, uh, uh, it used to be the original machines probably were one foot wide, then they grew to two, and three was very common for many years. Uh, my uh, former company's newest uh, machines are four foot uh, cutting heads. And they use diamond blades, which are very expensive. And your cost factors are based on the type of aggregate. faulted joints or bumps that may have been there since construction. It removes surface defects that develop over many years under traffic and weather. A smooth, level road lasts longer under repeated traffic loads because there's less impact uh, on the pavement. Diamond grinding is effective on all classes of pavements, from airports to interstates to city streets. And we have, uh, our company has done many city streets and uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, the knowledge of diamond grinding uh, often doesn't get down to the, to the uh, city level and uh, they don't know about it, so uh, the industry continually tries to get people informed, but uh, a forum like this is good for, for putting that uh, in your thinking cap when you have some corrective work that needs to be done. Uh, diamond grinding is uh, probably about half the cost of a bituminous overlay and eliminates uh, the bituminous overlay problems uh, like rutting and, and reflective cracking. Uh, the half the cost is a general statement. It could be more, it could be less, again, depending on, on the cost of your aggregates and some other factors I'll get to uh, later. Diamond grinding uh, does not require uh, adjustment to any adjacent pavement uh, structure and requires application only in the lanes where it's needed. Now, there could have to be a transition between a paved shoulder or a, if you're only grinding the driving lane, a transition. If, uh, if the passing lane doesn't exactly match, but that could be a fairly minor amount of grinding or additional grinding. Uh, diamond grinding uh, improves the pavement rideability without uh, interfering with drainage uh, conditions. Diamond grinding is not milling or scarifying and milling, again, uh, and, and the manufacturers of milling equipment and so forth tried to promote it as a, as a smoothness uh, technique a few years ago, but it actually does more damage than help because of the impact uh, the carbide tips have on the pavement. Um, if a pavement uh, um, 
exhibits excessive decracking or other serious problems, obviously those need to be repaired before the grinding is done. Sometimes, uh, again as Don pointed out, uh, if a pavement gets to a certain level of deterioration, uh, CPR methods are simply not applicable. You're into a uh, reconstruction job then. Smoothness requirements for grinding uh, and CPR projects should be equivalent to those required for new construction. Oftentimes they're more stringent than new construction. Uh, incentives and disincentives are common in grinding contracts. If you exceed the specification, you get a little bonus. If you don't make it, you get a penalty. Uh, the industry uh, is all for that because we want quality work. Another area of concern, of course, as I mentioned, grinding is done with water-cooled diamond blades. Uh, this produces a uh, slurry, a wastewater, if you will. And uh, in some states, uh, they require the slurry to be vacuumed and put into tanks, hauled away, uh, put in an evaporation pit of some type, and uh, later covered up. We believe in most situations this is totally unnecessary and adds a uh, an extremely high cost element to the process that uh, could be avoided by permitting the slurry, which most states do, permitting the slurry to be pumped directly to the shoulder where it also will evaporate. And obviously concrete slurry is primarily lime, so it might even fertilize the, uh, the grass. In s urban applications where uh, there's drainage considerations or no berms. Uh, obviously then you would have to resort to the vacuuming and uh, hauling off the job site. As project owners, you could minimize the additional cost there by having a dis disposal site available so that the contractor didn't have to go out and hunt down such a site and, and uh, it increases the cost considerably. So if you have a grinding job that requires slurry disposal, uh, it might be a good idea to consider where the uh, project owner might already have an area that could be developed for that use. The uh, direction of, of diamond grinding does, does not affect or influence the uh, smoothness of the resulting uh, uh, profile. The uh, best direction for grinding depends on, on sequencing operations and work zone uh, uh, limitations. In other words, going against the traffic or with the traffic, uh, it doesn't make a difference, but it's most commonly done going with the traffic, but sometimes there are reasons that can't be done. Um, Field performance shows that a concrete pavement may be ground up to three times without significantly compromising its fatigue life. Diamond grinding does not introduce any unusual conditions that would lead to poor surface durability. And this has also been a concern that's been expressed many times over the years but proven to be uh, no concern because uh, uh, as has been mentioned there's pavements particularly I'd say in California and in Georgia where diamond grinding of highway pavements really uh, was first uh, done on a large scale that there have been pavements that have been done two or three times. And uh, there is documented uh, uh, performance of diamond grinding pavements that uh, have shown that 90% last at least 9.5 years and 50% at least 13.5 years, uh, thus the number of 10 years that uh, uh, Don mentioned earlier is a typical life of a, of a diamond ground pavement. Ohio um, has not uh, been consistent in grinding programs, probably close to 
20 something years ago, there's a fairly major amount of grinding done at various locations in Ohio. Then there wasn't much done until uh, they rode over uh, running north from Marietta. They did quite a bit of grinding in those areas and patching. And now, uh, more recently, uh, the job in uh, Hancock County in Findlay uh, is underway now. Uh, and there's also one uh, on I-70 in Clark County that uh, grinding is a component of that job. And although our, I personally helped uh, promote those jobs, our company unfortunately didn't get either one of them. But uh, that's the, the uh, low bid system. Um, thankfully, uh, Don did cover a lot of the territory that I will not uh, repeat, but uh, I will say that timing is critical. Uh, I would agree with that. And uh, the question of whether to seal joints or not seal joints, I know, is uh, one that's being talked about in the industry. But I truly think many pavements. Uh, could be saved by simply a uh, timely joint resealing uh, program that uh, that might be all that has to be done if it's done in a timely fashion. But quite often uh, you will see the joint material allowed to deteriorate and cease to function and then the pavement further deteriorates and then you're faced with a more major uh, maintenance problem. Um, the good news about me not being an engineer is uh, I don't have a lot of charts and graphs, or none, and I probably talk faster than engineers, so uh, my presentation is uh, going, is uh, done. <laughs> Unless uh, if you have questions or uh, anything on diamond grinding or grooving, uh, our company also, uh, I have a hard time not calling it our company, but my former company also uh, does the slot cutting for uh, dowel bar retrofits uh, that were mentioned earlier. We do uh, a lot of uh, concrete pavement resealing. We still do some green uh, concrete sawing and sealing on, on major projects. So. Uh, we are into a bunch of kind of obscure businesses that uh, uh, most people probably don't think about very often, but I'll be happy to answer any questions if there are any. If not, uh, at the ACPA uh, table, there are several publications that I would call to your attention and urge you to read them. Uh, this one is on diamond grinding. There's another one similar to this on, on all of the pavement repair uh, CPR techniques. Uh, there's a report on uh, grinding versus milling and where milling is appropriate and uh, where grinding is more appropriate. There's also a uh, specific paper on load transfer retrofit devices. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity, even though I'm no longer in the business, I always like to uh, promote concrete pavements and, and concrete pavement restoration because uh, I think the uh, black stuff for the base is just fine, but uh, uh, I'm a lifelong believer in uh, Portland cement concrete pavements. So thank you. Uh oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, take this stuff well, off. On the, uh, on the age and <laughs> our work skills and so forth. Hans and my dad started a paving company at Lima, at the Lima Tank Depot. Operation. They still are making building tanks. At that time, they processed GFOs for overseas shipping. They had this 
plant engineer, and uh, Ren Reese uh, worked with Dad in the plant maintenance uh, type operation. I think he was a, My father was a crane operator. He was a crane operator. We got the crane operator and uh, equipment operators in the audience. And uh, they started a concrete paving business because the, the government told them, says, all this equipment's getting all muddy when you, when you get it in here and move it around the facility, it's, it's muddy. So we want to pave everything that's not paved. Well, our fathers saw an opportunity. And uh, very successfully, they went into business and paved everything around the minor tank that followed. And my dad was always proud after the band retired that he was older than Rand, as I am older than Benny, which is what we knew him as when he was three years old and four years old. Uh, Dad was always proud of the fact that the Red Race Company went on and did so well across the nation. There, we, so you'll have to, under, I'm saying that so you'll understand why John is uh, such an uh, advocate of concrete paper. He literally grew up only knowing concrete paper as his father's work. So, with that, Joe Kindler. Joe Kindler is our next presenter and our last presenter of the day. And Joe and I have been friends, we figured out a while ago, what, since the 70s? And we were involved in a very major paving project when we first got involved. And that project was paving my driveway. I just built a house up in Dublin, and I wanted a brick driveway. My dad had engineered brick streets in Spencerville, which was our hometown. And dad was the engineer when they paved the main street in Spencerville, as a lot was, with paving bricks. And I always had a fondness for paving bricks. I think that's my Germanic background. So I decided I wanted a brick driveway at my home in Dublin, and it was a big driveway. And I ended up somewhere between 80 and 100 tons of street pavers in there that I salvaged from around various places. And part of it was because Joe was the city maintenance engineer for the city of Columbus. And I had discovered a dump where there was a whole lot of paving brick, but it was on city property. So every time I wanted to go get some brick, I had to get permission from Joe. And I felt it him for giving me my, my brick driveway. And so Joe and I have been friends ever since, and he is now a consultant. He was with the state of Ohio. Uh, as, as a maintenance engineer, so he's had a lot of experience in, in engineering maintenance, and uh, he now has KMS and Associates Limited, lo still located in Dublin. Okay. Uh, this thing with the bricks. <laughs> now, here we go. See, every time, I, I can't win on these. <laughs> this was back before they came in, became important. We were actually trying to get rid of them at that time. Uh, be, yeah, I get this the right way. Because at that time, uh, the brick streets in German Village, what we did with them was to pave them or chip seal them. And that was not a problem. They were happy to do that at that time. That changed. Okay. A recent article in the Columbus Dispatch says that the city is trying desperately to find the street paper. Ah. Unfortunately, I sold that house. Bricks in Okay. Uh, yeah, I, start, I started out with the state, uh, then went to the city of Columbus, and uh, was out with a contractor one day, wanted to know if I wanted to invest in a slurry seal company. And I said, well, I couldn't do that. That'd be a conflict of interest. And he said, well, you have to quit your job. I said, well, why would I quit this job as maintenance engineer? This is, the, this is great. You know, I get snow and ice in the wintertime. I got leaf pickup, I got potholes, I got all these people calling me, wanting to talk to me all the time. And, and th then I said, yeah, I think I'll, I'll try that. 
Um, so I did maintenance type work for, SEP for the, the next 14 years. And for the last years, what I've done is I've done a variety of things in the area relating to that. And what I finally come up with is uh, pavement management. Because uh, when uh, Gary was talking about riding in the car, I was riding in the car with the rail before Gary was riding in the car with the rail. And at that time, that's the best thing we had. And I look back now at what the way I did things. And I had the feeling that let me get, have the money, let me spend the money before somebody else wastes it. And I challenge anybody to spend it any better than I could spend it. But looking back now, if I'd had a management system, I could have done a better job. What I was doing back then, I was going to the grocery store hungry. I wasn't planning. And that's where we have to go. It's the only way we can get more The, uh, unless we can get a lot more money, and most people can't get a lot more money. We've got to use our money better. So uh, a pavement management will help you uh, make better decisions. Not that you don't make good decisions now, but it'll give you more information, which will help. Uh, this one here about it asks the question, what should be left out? When the councilman comes to you, or whoever says, this street has to be done this year. Well, if you've already got a program set up and it is backed up with documentation, you can say, what should I take out? And, and then maybe they might find a little bit more money for their projects. Incidentally, um, this whole presentation is on a PowerPoint presentation, and it's all on a leaflet on the back, back table there. Back in, the, back in the old days, back when I started with the city, what project would we do? Well, who showed up? What material was available? What equipment was running? That was back in... We used to, ha no, I, I never did have the lanterns to put in the truck for heaters. We had heaters in the trucks. Um, then, then as time went on, we got more organized. We'll take a tough project and we'll take a couple easy projects and we'll alternate them, you know, rather than do all the easy projects. Uh, or who's squeaking the loudest? But as far as planning, it was, it was it was an attempt. Now, the safety thing is they want the problems fixed before they happen. It isn't how much more money you're going to have, it's how many less people you'll have or how much less money you'll have. Uh, police needs a new car or fire needs a new truck, so you fix up that snowplow. So we need to, to plan and to know what we have. A pavement management system will help us know what we have on our pavements. It'll help to start categorizing them in a manner that makes sense to other people. Gary talked about when the head leaves, say, all the information is gone. What we do in maintenance is to keep all the stuff in our head. When I was with Columbus, I had three guys that knew the, the whole city cold. I could give them an intersection and they could tell me what the pavement was like. When they retired, that information was gone. With a pavement management system, we can start keeping that. And when we can show this to somebody and say, this is what it looks like. Here's the excellent routes, here's the good ones, here's the fair, the poor, the failed. 
the way they are right now. Uh, that we're starting to be able to talk to people on the same level, one to one. So we start; they start to understand. An inventory. Uh, Paul had uh, from Akron had mentioned that he didn't know exactly how many numbers miles of streets he had. Well, that's not unusual. I was up to a, a city in northern Ohio, and they knew they had over a thousand miles of streets, but they didn't know if they had 1,200 or not. But these are people spending millions of dollars a year. I talked with a, a person in a city on the southern border of Ohio, and she was explaining to me that she didn't need any, any type of program. She knew exactly what resurfacing needed to be done. She had a total handle on all of her streets in the city. And I was just thinking of what I could say next of, well, if I could give her a proposal, maybe that wouldn't scare her off. So I said, how many miles of streets do you have? She had no idea. I said, well, nearest 20 miles or something. Couldn't even give me a ballpark figure. The city engineer spoke up and says, we got 124 miles. Well, here, here a person is making decisions but doesn't know what they have. And, and of course, she didn't want to talk to me anymore because I had embarrassed her. So an inventory is real important because if you don't know what you have, how can you take care of it? Uh, and considerations of, of different things like whether it's an arterial or a residential. How many do you have of each? Do you treat your arterials differently than your residentials? Of course you do. Uh, special routing, like the mayor's route, that might be important. When I was with the state, the, uh, the director of operations would travel one route to and from work. That grass was always mowed good. Uh, types of pavements, that's important because each one reacts a little differently and you treat them differently. Uh, when it was last done is important because that way, if you know when it was last resurfaced and you know the condition of it, you can start to say, am I getting my money's worth? And of course, the zones, physical boundaries, uh, one council district always wants to compare it to another one. Um, or if you have a county set up in outposts, like Franklin does, they have it set up as each zone is an outpost zone, so they can compare how they do with each other, which is important. Branches and sections. This is a way a management system is set up. You'll have a branch, which is the main route, and then you'll have sections. And the first section might be from here to here because it has a certain width. And if the width changes, it'll from here to here will be a different section. And then from here to here may have the same width, but may have a different surface type. So everything in a section is the same. And we can, we got to break it down to that. And then in each section, a sample is taken. And there's a variety of ways to do inspections. There's some, it depends how much you want to pay. You can get it, uh, like uh, Gary was saying, Franklin County has a, went to the micropaver, which is a low tech, not necessarily, but he said that. Where the city of Columbus has a very high tech management system where they use the thumper and the, all that type of thing. So you can get a lot of different types of inspections. Or you can go to the inspection of the system that the state uses, which is a, strictly a visual thing. Uh, if you're able to stop the car, you stop the car, get out and look. Otherwise, you go down the road. So there's all di it's all relative to what you want and what you need. Uh, but most of them go on surface distresses. 
And that means the, the cracking, the severity of it, the, the amount of it, the potholes, the raveling, the rutting. There's a distress manual that uh, the feds came out with that does a pretty good job showing distresses. Here again, all inspections are not equal. The, uh, the windshield, or actually walking on the pavement, I found that if I set up a sample area and I get out of the car and I start measuring how many feet, I find more distresses. Because when you're actually right there on it, you'll see more of it. So you get a more accurate account of what you have. Accuracy is in, in the inspection. If you don't have an accurate inspection, what good is anything else? The, the micro paver is the only inspection that has an ASTM number. They've jumped through all the hoops. There's a lot of other management systems that will use the micro paver inspection system because it is good. I can have Everybody in this room go out and inspect a sample area with the distresses, follow the book, and they'll be very, very close. They'll be within three or four or five PCI points. So it's reproducible. And then when the inspection is done in two years, you have something to compare it to. That's important. Or if you're want to compare what you have to another city and they're using the same system, same system, you're comparing apples and apples. It works. It helps you to organize things. And, that, and that's to do planning, we have to organize things. A good management system will develop curves pavement curves to show you how your pavement actually does deteriorate. You know, they, uh, the way we've always been taught that the pavement curves start at the top and then go down like that. Well, if you don't do any maintenance on the pavement, it will. I, had, I did one city that their philosophy was build it, replace it and don't do anything in the middle. And their pavement curve started at the top and went down. What I see mostly is the pavements will come down to about, about a 50 and then they'll flatten out. Because at about a 50, people are starting to patch it, crack seal it, spot overlay it, do all those things necessary to keep it from falling. And those are the expensive things. If they, had, if they had done some preventative maintenance work up in here, they'd been ahead. And that's one of the things that a pavement management system will throw you into. It'll encourage you to do preventative maintenance. And you'll be able to show the benefits of it. Preventative maintenance is not glitzy. It's good preventative maintenance sort of just lays there and does nothing. But it's saving you money all that time. Uh, a good management system will let you adopt your repair techniques to it so that it, it fits what you do. I was talking to one engineer and they said, well, we want the, the management, uh, the repair techniques to be this and this and this. We square up the potholes, do it right. I said, well, are you doing that now? No, but I want the management system to show that. I said, well, then who are you fooling? The management system needs to be set up the way you're doing it. Now, if you want to change the way you're doing it, then change that. But have it show you what you are actually doing, and it'll do that. Uh, for example, I have Franklin County, I have Licking County. 
their repair techniques are very different. Franklin County's got a lot of money. Licking County doesn't have much at all. So uh, Licking County does a lot of chip seal. Franklin County does a lot of overlay. So they're, and uh, Licking County doesn't do much uh, pothole repairs like Franklin does by using the saw and saw cutting it out and that type of thing. A management system will show you projections. For example, in this case, uh, we did a projection for a county at $500,000 a year. And this shows that he's losing ground at $500,000 a year. And it could be set up for $600,000. It could be set up for the first year at uh, five hundred, the second year at six hundred. You can vary it. Whatever you need to do, it'll do. But a projection is based on the model, and that shows what is happening exist existing type conditions. So, and you can have a model for the arterials, a model for the collectors, a model for the asphalt, a model for the concrete, a model for the chip seal. You can have as many models as you need so that it shows what you have. Uh, also, in the projection, these were the pavements that were going to get overlaid in the corresponding years. I took this to the county manager and I said, what do you think? And he said, I've just been spending a couple weeks thinking about what I needed to do over the next few years. And it looks pretty close to that. He said, now, of course, I wouldn't spread this out over four, over four years or three years. I do that in one year. I said, of course. That's common sense. And, and let me step back. Maintenance has got to be common sense. That was one of the first things I learned. I was very fortunate when I started with ODOT. They set me up with uh, the operations engineer said, let's just assume you don't know anything and put me out with uh, eight county managers. He said, you spend two weeks with each one before you even think about making a decision. And they taught me common sense. Because that's how they did it. Because they needed to use common sense because they were at the grassroots. And if they did something stupid, uh, the, uh, the county uh, committee man would talk to them or the residents that live next door. So common sense is important. Uh, also, with a, a good management program with GIS, which is nothing more than mapping, you can show what the condition is in year one, and then if the work plan is followed, what it'll be in the following years. This is a, a type of thing that you show to people, and all of a sudden, they, they really believe you know what you're doing. Now, this isn't any different than you could do yourself. But it's consistent. It uses the same thoughts all the time. I talked to one city engineer, and I was trying to talk him into a management system. And he said, no, I don't think so. I'm going to be leaving in six months. I said, well, when you came in here three years ago, wouldn't you have liked to have had this? He said, oh, yeah. But it wasn't high on his priority when he was leaving. The other thing that is so important is it gives us the place to plug in history and to show history. For example, in this case, in, this was originally resurfaced back in 91. In 99, they did some edge paving. And in 2000, they did some spot paving. And this is what the graph of the section looks like. So we can start seeing what the benefit is of what we do. Even if it's not a full-blown overlay, if it's just a crack seal or a spot paving, we can start seeing what it is, what the benefit is. If, say we've got a, a but it's a, a new product or something. Put it on this, and it'll show you within a few years whether it's doing what it's supposed to do.
In this case, um, the first one was, was an inspection. The second was, was an inspection after they applied the rejuvenator. The third was an inspection. And the fourth is project, how the projection is. So by spending so much money per square yard, they can see what they're getting for it and see if they're getting it. That's, we need to have that type, we need to have that kind of input. So it tells us more about what to do, when to do it, and probably why we're doing it. The GASB 34, this is the Governmental Accounting Standards Board. They're gonna force county, states, cities, into being more accountable, they're going to have to have a condition rating system if they want to get bond ratings. And this is going to happen in the next couple of years. So they're already working towards it. When they were setting up this accounting standard, they talked with the micropaver people to be sure that there was a pavement management system out there that could do what needs to be done. It'll support your, support your decisions. In, in maintenance, how many times has somebody come up to you and said, boy, you really fixed that road at the right time? I figured when I was with Columbus, if I got a compliment, that was worth like about 400 other ones that people didn't think to call in about. Because I sure got more complaints than compliments. In, in maintenance, we need support because we're, we make a lot of decisions. And if we have something to base it on, something to, to back us up, that's important. And this, a management system will do that. You have to have funding for the management system. If you just have the management system put in, and you don't keep up the inspections, it isn't any good. Now, the, the GADSB 34 is going to require inspections every three years. In my opinion, three years is too, too long because our pavements change so fast. It used to be that when I was with Columbus back in the 70s, pavements would stay the same for four or five years. They wouldn't change. Now it seems like every couple of years we're getting changes. So a two-year inspection seems to be about right with where we are now. But you have to have funding for it. When you pick out a system, where is it being used? And how well do they like it? What are the shortcomings? All of this, do some research on it. You just don't go with a, a salesman coming in saying, I've got this thing that's better than sliced bread. It's something that you're going to live with for a long time. It's something you're going to have a lot of, uh, have to have a lot of confidence in because it's going to help you with your decisions. So talk to people that are using one. Not that just bought it, but are using it. Installation. Uh, People are capable of doing it in-house. It can be done. But then, if you do that in-house, what are you not doing? When I was with the City of Columbus, uh, we set up a, uh, a maintenance management system where we tried to manage w our activities. If they had asked me to do that, I'd have I wasn't able to, to keep up with everything I was doing. So we had to hire it out. 
So with the management system, I would recommend you out, outdate it or out, uh, get it done outside. Now, there's some places that can do the inspections internally. But then again, if the people are doing that, what are they not doing? And the other thing that I've found, when I was, truck dri when I was in Columbus, I was talking to a truck driver one time. And I said, you know, if we buy this really good cold mix, we could patch more potholes than if we use hot mix. And, I'm, and I'm, at that time, my thinking was cold mix was made to be to use for patching potholes. That made for that. You know, it would work in water, this type of thing, and it didn't get cold and so forth, whereas the hot mix would get cold because you could only do it for a couple hours and then you had to throw away what was left and then you had to go back down to the plant and wait in line and then you had to drive through town, through the university area to get back to the, the work site. Whereas with cold mix, you could load the truck up with cold mix, go out to the work site and stay there all day. And I told this to a truck driver. And I said, you could probably, instead of doing four tons a day, you could probably do six tons a day. And his response was, why? And at that time, I really didn't have an answer for him. And it's a thing where if, if you put the inspection job on somebody else that's out there running around anyway, why? And the inspection is so important because it's, it's detail-oriented, it's boring, it's, it's a thing where, but it has to be accurate. Otherwise, how can you have confidence in the system? So, support. The program you, you choose has to have support because when I was with the city, somebody would show me something and in a month I would forget it. And even though most of the management systems are very uh, user-friendly. They're oriented so that most people can do it easily. There's still odds and ends here that you need to, need to know and need to have support. You need to have somebody you can call and say, hey, I've run into this thing. How do, what do I do or how do I get this graph? So you need the support available. And you need to make sure that it's going to be around for five or ten years. Ohio State had a system uh, six years ago. And the, the fellow that had set it up or was running it left or some reason. So they had this data, but there wasn't any support to utilize it. So they changed their system. They went to one that's going to be around for a while. So it's, you're looking for the long term. That's why you need to check to see who's using it and are they satisfied. Updates, everything changes. Everything gets, you know, hopefully it gets, goes to the better. Uh, R&D. How much money is being spent on it? Who's paying for it? What's the cost to get it? All of those things are important. Because you really want the most up-to-date thing you can have, especially going into the GIS area. And they tie together pavement maintenance and preventative maintenance or pavement management. Um, I always show this because I, I think it's so phenomenal. Michigan did the preventative maintenance and they spent $80 million and when they figured out how much would they have spent if they hadn't, they came up with $700 million. You know, that's, that's like saying you take $80,000 over a period of six years and if you didn't do that, you'd spend $700,000. I got to bring the numbers down to something I can realize. Millions just don't register. 
Preventative maintenance pays. It'll save you money. And a, and a management system will help to get you in there. And common sense. If you can do something at the top to keep it there, I say you spend nickels. If you, you wait a little longer, you spend dimes. Or down at the bottom, you're spending dollars. It's just common sense. It's like uh, we change the oil, we give the engine a tune-up, or we replace it type thing. Put air in the tires, rotate them, or replace them. We do this every day with all of our stuff. I, li I like these. Um, with a management system, your head keeps sticking out of the sand because you're going to see what you got. And other people are going to see what you have. I set up one city and consul told them that they wanted a higher level of a service. So the city engineer went through the program, went to consul and said, if, to get you this level of service, here's the funding we're going to need. The consul said, well, uh, we don't have that much money. How much money, how, what kind of level of service will this amount of money get you? They figured it up and the consul said, okay, that's acceptable. So all of a sudden, they're talking on the same plane. They're talking to each other, apples and apples. And, th and that's what we need to do. And the other thing, with preventative maintenance, I talk to people about doing preventative maintenance, and people will say, well, we can't put out all the fires we have. Well, if we're not doing it all anyway, Let's take 10% of our money and put it into preventative maintenance. Just one little fire less we're not putting out. And that way, maybe we, eventually we can get off of that precarious position we're in all the time. Because the only way we can get ahead is through preventative maintenance. And it's, it's the, the out of the box thinking. It's not thinking the way we did it last year. You know, if we spend pennies, pennies for preventative maintenance and have a pavement management system to back it up, it'll help. Any questions? What is the 34 stand for gas? Uh, you got me. Don't know, don't know. That might be the paragraph that they have or whatever. But it is a standard and it's available. Um, also, I've got a little PowerPoint uh, printout on if you're looking for a management system, questions to ask. And of course, just a brochure on the, the micropaver, which, which is a good management system and affordable. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We can do projections. Projections, predictions, yeah. Yeah. Software is about 900 bucks. Soft, software is nothing. Software is very inexpensive. It's the installation that's more. Because that's where all the work is. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Joe, it's back to you.